Bespoke Radio for the Masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network. All right. How you doing? Fade to Black. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Today is Wednesday, April 17th, 2024. Very excited about the show tonight. It has been an amazing week. Another amazing week here on Fade to Black. I don't know how we do it. It's it's just so funny. 10 years, over 10, 11 years, uh, soon to be 12, uh, doing this show uh, so many nights a week. And every time we wrap a week and we start another one, and I think, how do we top how do we top what we just did? How do we top that? How do we top that? How? And we just do it week after week after week. This week has been incredible. We're going to continue it tonight. And uh, we have uh, uh, Leslie Mitchell Clark here with us tonight. We're going to be talking about uh, hypnotherapy of the alien kind. We'll get to all of that uh, with Leslie in just a second. But you got to remember on Monday, we had James Beecham from CERN, live from Geneva, Switzerland, on the show, a physicist on the show. Absolutely incredible. Last night, Lynn Katai on the show. Tonight, Leslie's with us. Tomorrow night, Britt Elders is here. That's an incredible week here on Fade to Black, and I am humbled and honored to be able to do this. I have six major events coming up in the second half of 2024, Want to remind everybody, the links for everything and tickets and information are below. Everything is selling out, and I just don't want everybody to be left out. Don't wait to the last minute. Uh, on uh, May uh, 12th, I have the Anaki, Anunnaki TV premiere at the largest cinema here in Los Angeles, Regal Cinemas in downtown L.A. with Billy Carson. And Disclosure Fest, our way to the stars, uh, coming up on the weekend of June 10th through the 12th here at Castaic Lake. That's a huge event. Uh, we're going to have uh, somewhere between ten and 15,000 people there for that. Uh, get your tickets and, and come out and hang out with us. Then in Miami, I've got the 2024 Conscious Awards, again, 4BK. And that is the weekend of August 3rd and 4th. Then I'm heading to Alaska, uh, contact at sea, going on a cruise. And that is September 6th through the 13th. Again, tickets are still available uh, for that. Uh, the Egypt tour is coming up. I come back from Alaska in September. October, I head to Egypt uh, with Billy Carson. And that tour is nearly completely sold out now, too. And if you want to go, get your tickets. And then I come back from that in October, turn around in November, and head to South America. I'll be going uh, to Peru and Bolivia with Brian Forrester. And that is uh, two weeks in Peru and Bolivia, November 15th through the 27th. Again, the links for everything are below. Okay, so get your tickets and, and come and hang out with me somewhere around the world. It's going to be an amazing rest of the year. But tonight, it's Leslie Mitchell Clark, and we are going to be discussing hypnotherapy, regression, uh, working with individuals uh, who believe that they've had uh, extraterrestrial, ultra-terrestrial contact, uh, or, you know, other other types of high strangeness as well. And this is the thing. Leslie's based out of Toronto, but she's got a music background. Dancer, vocalist, uh, 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 public relations of jazz artist. And the, that part of it and the connection to what she is doing today is there. And tonight I'm going to find out about that too as well. She's got an amazing career. She's amazing. 
And the links to her website, which is lightworkhypnosis.com, are below on social media and over on our website. But I'd like to welcome to the for the first time to fade to black, and she's right there, Leslie Mitchell Clark. Oh, Les- Jimmy! <laughs> you know, it, it's 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 about time. It's about time, and I'm I'm very excited uh, about yeah. It, I'm very excited about the show, but. We have to do the first time guest disclaimer. I can't believe this oh. is the first time you've been on the show, but uh, this, is a tra- <laughs> this is a tradition that goes back a long ways. So we have to get it done. And the disclaimer is this Leslie, it's just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. Where the conversation starts, it starts. Where it ends, it ends. But we're going to end as friends. Do you accept? I completely accept that. Okay. Klaatu Nikto Baratu. <laughs> right, right on, right on, right on, right on. I've got the, that's that's literally on my coffee. <laughs> right there, there he is. Okay, so um, oh my, I, I want to I, I want to start here, and um, it's 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 on my mind. What is it about? aliens and musicians help me out here help me understand the connection well uh, i think i think we have to go maybe uh, uh, just a, a, a tad deeper and embrace probably all artistic people um you know my my feeling is and you know after doing this kind of work for about 20 years that there is really one big commonality between experiencers and uh it's not where their education it's not where they live it's not their profession really the the commonality seems to be psychic ability and i think that all artists generally have enhanced sensitivities and therefore are probably far more open to um, all kinds of stimuli and, and, and what have you. So I think it's part of the package because you are absolutely right in saying that a preponderance of experiencers, whether they're professional musicians or not, certainly have artistic abilities and it is it just seems to come with the territory and also you know there's 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 an intelligence factor and i'm not again i'm not talking about education because I, there are some experiencers i've worked with that have you know you know a, i was going to say something political but i won't but just a very you know a, maybe an eighth grade level education mm. but they are so intuitive and intuitively intelligent it just hasn't been refined and they haven't received this type of education that that they should have so but the ets don't seem to be concerned with that they're looking for um they're looking for um well also i would have to say that they are some ET races are completely telepathic, especially the ones that tend to be rather advanced. Now they can usually, they usually can speak, but you know, the speed of thought is certainly much quicker. So uh, they, I believe that they are looking for beings that it's just simply easier to work with. I mean, if you were Jane Goodall, you know, and you're out in the, the, you know, darkest Africa, Oh, that's probably politically incorrect to say. Just shoot me when I say something bad. Just tase me. I don't even know if it's bad or not. But anyway, in Africa, <laughs> there's, there's Jane Goodall, and she discovers a new species of primate that has a you know a, a larynx, a voice box that can actually articulate words. Now, wouldn't Jane Goodall or any other scientist or person trying to make communication spend most of their time with those? beings, those simians that could actually articulate words and converse. I think that it's a bit like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. It, it, it does. And and then there's the, if, if you flip it over and go in the other direction and and maybe maybe understand a little bit that these artists, these creatives, mm-hmm. Um, that go into the zone 
where that magic happens, yes. whether it's painting or poetry yes. or, or, yes. or writing. They're in, or, the, they're in the alpha state. They're in a receptive the, alpha state much comes, of the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, 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 and they get, they get downloaded. They do. They receive downloads. And, you know, also there's a lot of nonverbal communication. I mean, on the bandstand, as you well know yourself, uh, you know, whether you're reading music literally or whether everybody knows the tune, it doesn't matter. But the band, uh, you know, where the solos come in, where the solos come out, what's happening, the, you know, the apexes, the whatever, that that is all sort of communicated psychically. I believe, uh, if if everybody's in the right space. Now, we all know, we've all experienced ego-based people who sadly um, have shut themselves down by their, by their, you know, complete love affair with themselves. So I think one of the main things that will, that will prevent, um, uh, you know, you having any experiences of high strangeness are going to be selfishness ego-based behavior, um, a, a closed mind, perhaps a, a narrow religious belief system that prevents you from going where you would naturally go. These things will all interfere. So <clears throat> the majority of people that I work with, um, I, actually, I'm going to let you guess because there's one profession that really stands out. And I have to say a high percentage of experiencers work in this one profession and um it may really? surprise you yeah there's one predominant okay. profession so it's not it's not going to be obvious to me so i've got to think outside the box is what you're saying it might uh, be it might be obvious oh, to you oh, okay i i'm gonna if i would take a guess i would say an educator you're right you're absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. There is a preponderance of teachers and educators of all levels, people that teach kindergarten, people that teach in university. I would have to say if there was one career that seems to dominate, at least, you know, at least in the people I were, I can only speak from my own, you know, experiences, but, you know, there aren't a whole lot of hypnotherapists who are trained and facile enough and and choose to do this kind of work you know and uh there there's the wonderful mary rodwell and in, in in australia and there's barbara lamb out on the west coast and there was of course the, the late dolores cannon but i wouldn't say there are a huge amount of us doing this work um but in my experience there is one profession that 60 percent maybe of the people wow, that's I work with. You know, and I, yeah. the reason why uh, I went there. Now, I surprised myself with that. Okay, I, in, in, in total transparency here to the audience, I that that was just a a wild guess. Mm-hmm. But I based it on um, who would be open to reception and learning, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a teacher because that's you are constantly you know, uh, bringing in data. Mm -hmm. And then you have to turn around and translate, transmute, Mm -hmm. and communicate what you have acquired. And so a teacher and an educator would be the one of the best mediums to do that along with painters and, and creative people too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and remember that many, many educators have facilities, artistic facilities. They might be music teachers. They Mm -hmm. might be visual art teachers. They might be. So, you know, we, we tend to see a a lot of, a lot of that. And, um, you know, my, my job, as I see it, because I believe that knowledge is power. I do. I believe it's always better to know than to not know. And, um, you know, a lot of times when people finally get to me, you know, I'm like a, I'm like a last chance Texaco to use a good American expression. I'm the last rung of psychiatric help. And, um, uh, so many of these dear people have been through a lot of processes, medications, therapies, only to be told that there's nothing wrong with them. So my job is to help these individuals uh, 
not only access their experiences, but integrate them. Because I'm all about the healing. Just just accessing the thing is not, you know, that's that's part of it. That's only part of it. Being able to integrate the experiences and and understand them and um, alleviate anxiety and terror and all these other things are are the biggest uh, the biggest part of the job. Although I will say, I will say, Jimmy, and I want to stress this too to your wonderful audience, most experiences that people are having or have had are either benign or good. Um, there are not, uh, there was a, a huge study. I was a part of it actually, MUFON and, and our friend Kathleen Martin, who I'm sure has been on the show. Uh, it was her project and it took 10 years and I must have regressed. I don't know how many people through this MUFON program, but it was a widespread study with a lot of properly vetted practitioners. And the results that came back were that maybe only 30% of the experiences were negative or terrifying or frightening. And so the vast majority of experiences that people are having are um, mind opening, uh, strange, you know, but, but not re not, not painful, not torture, not terrifying in the way that, you know, we would be led to believe. I mean, I, I think part of that is that the agreement, you know, the old Truman agreement timed out made with the Zeta Reticulites and they were responsible for a lot of that rather aggressive uh, taking of genetic material. But those people who experienced that kind of trauma would now be probably close to 70. So it's a little more unusual, but I, it would be, it would have to be usually an older person recalling something from their early twenties or what have you. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. I want to go on the record really quick and then we'll move on uh, and, and just say this. Um, Kathleen Martin mm -hmm. is quite possibly the coolest person on planet earth. <laughs> I okay, so I'm, uh, yeah, I, I, I love, love her. <laughs> so I just want to leave that right there. Hello, Kathleen. Yeah, I love okay. her. Yeah. She's the, the absolute best. The absolute best. She is. Uh, she is. Now uh, let's let's back up if we can. Uh, we got a little bit ahead of our skis, but I mm. like where we are right now. But how how did you take the left hand turn mm. off of the freeway into this world? Was there a single event that happened or was there an interest uh, that was already there? Well, there was always, there was always an interest there. My father was interested in space and science fiction. We always had a telescope. The interest was always there. And then, you know, when I was probably 14 or something, you know, uh, Eric Von Donneken's little uh, Super 8 film came out, <laughs> Chariots of the Gods. And after I saw that, that was, uh, that really turned on all kinds of memory engrams where it resonated with me. And I said, now, well, this is true. We are, we are a, we are a global civilization with amnesia. We don't remember what happened, you know, and we've been the recipient of all kinds of DNA, probably. So that was a turning point. Now, I had some rather fantastic experiences when I was away doing summer stock the first year when I was a young actor. And I don't usually talk about this, but I but I think your your readers might might enjoy uh, hearing about it. So anyway, when I was about six, I finished high school early. I was 16 and I was accepted um, as a young actor in the company at a summer theater, which was in the uh, the Black Hills of South Dakota. That's where the Rushmore heads are, you know, South uh, uh, Rushmore State Park. So that's where this beautiful theater complex was that had been there for so long. So in the company, there was a, a uh, really talented young lady, and I thought she was fantastically mature and sophisticated and old, and she was probably in her late 20s, you know, maybe at the most, but that's how I saw her. Now, we, you know, we became buddies, and when we had to drive in 
to the town of Custer, which was the closest little town, I'm serious, Custer, South Dakota, um, uh, we would take a circuitous mountain route. And I started noticing that every time I drove somewhere with her at night, we were followed by lights lights that would move quickly that would be close that would be far away and and remember now this is this is native Cana uh, native american territory this is lakota the lakota people's land it's a no fly zone they don't have airplanes flying around over the you know over that the custer state park anyway so uh, eventually um she confessed to me or told me rather because i thought this was so anomalous that she had another job and actually worked for the government as a psychic and her job was communicating with uh extraterrestrial beings and she what? said she, yep what? She, what? 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 Yep. wait 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 whoa whoa how old were you 16 i'm i'm 16 and my how friend do you, is, how do you how do you how do you even understand something like that at the age of 16? It just, I could feel, I could feel the energy of the beings in the craft. I could feel the changes in energy. I could feel a lot of this. Um, that's the only way I can explain it. I didn't question that she was telling me the truth. So oh, I didn't oh, even yeah. question it. So she told me, yes, you know, this is, this is what's happening. And I am, I'm exhausted from it. I'm trying to leave the program and they won't let me. I mean, she was a musician who worked in Reno and Tahoe. So I imagine that, you know, she'd get up at six in the morning and she'd go to a plane wrap, you know, airport and get in a plane wrap plane and they take her and other psychics and other people out to you know dreamland or wherever wherever the underground base was it was underground wherever she went so um so this was happening and and you know these craft eventually got close enough where i was actually even to able to see i would have to call them portholes but they appeared and disappeared so it it, it was really something else now one afternoon <laughs> i was and this is the same summer one afternoon i was hanging out at the snack bar which i did rather well and uh, there were probably 300 people in this theater company and for some reason there was nobody there just me like alone and this car uh like a late model it almost looked like an edsel i think it sort of had wings it was like a town car from many years before this car speeds in and uh goes around this you know circle thing and drives up and go stops right in front of her my friend's uh little cabin where she lived now um two, I'm going to have to call them beings, two beings got out of the car. And the reason I call them beings is because their skin looked to be uh, plastic. That's the only way I can put it. It didn't look like humanoid skin. It looked like a doll skin, plastic skin, prosthetics. I don't know. That's what it looked like. And they were also wearing and I kid you not, they, as Jack Parr used to say, they were also wearing like 1940s style suits, like like George Raft suits, like Kirk and Spock when they go back in time in the original Star Trek, you know, with the shoulder pads and the fedora. This is what they were wearing. Now, I also noticed as they got out of the car that, <laughs> that their pants were quite short like high waters you know the pants were too short and they were wearing what looked to me like orthopedic shoes i'm now thinking well i wonder if they were weighted shoes i wonder if they had a different relationship with gravity i don't know so anyway these two beings go into her little cabin and still there's no one around i'm just standing there and i think well i can't let this go on i i've i've got to go in there and and do something, you know, I don't know what I was going to do, you know, wave my tuna sandwich at them. I didn't know what I was going to do. But um, just as just seconds before I was going to barge in, uh, these two beings came out, got back in the car and sped away. And of course, I ran whatever there and I said, you know, WTF, you know, what what the hell was that? And, uh, and she said, well, those were just, uh, you know, those were two two beings trying to convince me 
to stay in the program, and I refused. So I honestly don't know whatever happened to this young lady. Um, I've tried to find her a couple of times, but with not much success, with no success. But that experience that summer and there's a part two to that but it's pretty it's pretty upsetting and gross but there's also a part two but it was it was quite um a turning point in my life now many years later of course you know i had other experiences on my own and occasionally would see some sort of craft or anomaly but nothing you know nothing uh, dramatic and um when um when i became a, a just a hypnotist when i had paid you know when i was about to pass the basic uh, course um i did so because i'd been having a midlife crisis really you know i i can only call it that i was d disgusted with the music business and um and my husband god bless him long suffering spousal unit <laughs> my husband bought me a past life regression and I thought, well, great, you know, I, I, I believe in this. Let me try it. So I went and had the regression. Now, of course, I took away wonderful, valuable information about my own, you know, lifetimes. But the main thing I took away is I knew inside myself, I knew that I could do that kind of work. I knew I'd done it before. I mean, hypnotherapy is 10,000 years old, minimally we know about so i something about that work resonated i took various accreditations eventually i took all my metaphysical certifications which is where the regression is really taught and really comes into play um so i was working at a pretty upscale hypnosis clinic uh at after i completed a bunch of my education and um about once a month we would get a call from some, you know, poor soul who believed they had had some type of incident of high strangers. Maybe they had missing time. Maybe they had triangular scars on their body. Maybe they thought they had an implant. I mean, it could have been any one of these things, but nobody else would touch these cases with a you know, 10 foot pole. Well, let me jump in right there. So the, so I can understand the clinic that you were working at was dealing with uh, eating disorders. Oh and smoking yeah, it was all like it was that. all upscale, middle aged biatches, you know, with facelifts. You know, it was it was it was all weight loss and anxiety and hypochondria and 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 you know all of that kind of thing. That's what we that was the bread and butter over there. And so, of course, none of these people wanted to do anything that was. It was that they felt that far out. But, you know, I said, bring it on, baby, bring it on. And so, you know, you know, you know who's got, um, uh, I just want to uh, uh, comment here. Uh, Sarah Breskman Cosme. I don't know if you know Sarah, yeah. but she's a great, they, she's one of my dearest friends and we're really close. And I had always said over the years that I would never, be regressed. There was no reason for me to do it. And, and I just want to leave everything alone, but you know, the two of us, you know, we got, and we still are, I mean, we're the closest and dearest of friends. So there's trust there. So I went for it, but that's not what's interesting. What is interesting is her story and how she got started is very similar to yours. Uh -huh. She got into big pharma. Uh, she was uh, going uh, into uh, the uh, psychology side of the world and the pharmacology support of psychiatric drugs. And, and she backed up. She started her career and she went, nobody's getting healthy. No. With these drugs, <laughs> no. there's got to be there's got to be another approach to this, and that's why she does hypnotherapy today mm -hmm. because it works. It it does, Jimmy, and and the thing is, of course, I I in, 
university, I was a psychiatric technician. I worked on the graveyard shift in a state mental hospital. So I really was on the ground floor with psychotropic meds because I'm an old broad. You know, it was a long time ago. And, um, uh, you know, the, the fact is, and I'm sure your dear friend will tell you this, that um, um, antidepressant SSRIs, SNRIs only work for about half the people or less that take them the rest of them rest of the people taking them are getting no result yeah misdiagnosis yeah and, and all kinds of things um now now let's let's go back so that one phone call a month yeah did you raise your hand and volunteer i raised my hand and volunteered and what i what i did to do this work uh, eventually as I moved along, um, I began, I adapted the tried and true techniques that we use for past life regression and interlife regression, a lot of them from the great Michael Newton. So I just, I didn't, re I don't want to, you to think I reinvented the wheel. I took tried and true regression techniques and I simply adapted them for the work that we were doing. Now, what I started to find out immediately uh, is most individuals who have had a contact experience are in fact lifetime experiencers. There are very few randomized episodes of contact. And often, um, you know, what before I work with someone, I like, you know, like Kathy Martin, I, I usually say that there must be at least one partially remembered memory. We have to start someplace, not just a feeling, not just, oh, I was creeped out, you know, whatever. <laughs> there has to be at least one kind of partially remembered, <coughs> excuse me, um, incident. And we start from there. So generally, when someone comes to me, after I've done intake and I determine the person is mentally stable, it's very important. Um, well, we, we need to circle back to that, by the okay. way. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Continue. Okay. What I do is I will take that one experience and I will lead the individual uh, through a, a process of relaxation, I will hopefully induct them into, you know, the, the, the theta state, which is optimum for any kind of, um, um, what shall I say, uh, ex uh, any kind of exploration like regression, any type of regression work. Now, the way the way regression works is that if we can get the body relaxed enough. And we do it today just by talking to people. But, you know, the ancient Romans who had sleep temples and the Greeks, they gave their, their patients a big opiated drink. They didn't bother with talking. They just got them into an altered state. So, but we do it healthfully, you know. So once if I can get the body relaxed enough, then that little veil or membrane or whatever curtain, whatever you wish to call it, that separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind just evaporates. And um, I can take you back to any point in your life, any, and you can tell me what you were wearing, what you ate for lunch, you know, everything is in the subconscious mind. Or, and also, I think that our memories also exist external to the physical body and to the, in the, you know, great, uh, great beyond. I think it's a huge, uh, the universe works like a huge computer and knowledge is just, is there to just access if you know how to do it. But at any rate, um, that's that's what I began to do. And I just heard so many amazing stories. And it was um one of the one of the earliest ones, oh, this is a long time ago now. A gentleman came to see me who was, amazingly enough, of course, a university professor, right? And this is a highly functional person, um, no history of mental health, no manic depression, no uh nothing, no borderline personality disorder, nothing. Totally mentally healthy person. And the memory that he came to me with was a partially remembered childhood memory 
where he had been on a trip with his parents coming through Montreal, not far from where Betty and Barney Hill, by the way, were, were taken. And um, he came to consciousness. There was, missing, there, was, there was hours of missing time. And when he came to consciousness, he was in his parents, you know, um, station wagon and he had his like uh, pajamas on backwards. So that's about all he had as far as what he could recall. So we got in that's there. That's a good start. That's a good starting point. That that's, was a good starting. That was a good starting point. He he had me at pajamas. So anyway. Yes. yes. <laughs> so we, uh, you know, I I led him through the beginning of the experience, and um, what actually happened is they were driving on this rural road, and his father sort of became switched off and focused and the father turned down an unmarked dirt road for no reason and this was late at night like 11 at night something like that the father turns down the road now we will probably have to discuss screen memories at some point but sometimes the ets uh, send us images that are uh that are not accurate so that we can accept them more easily. So my, my guy looked out of the window of the station wagon and he thought he saw a troop of Cub Scouts riding their bikes next to the car. Okay, this is 11 at night out in the middle of nowhere. It was not Cub Scouts. I assume these were other beings who were guiding somehow the station wagon into where they wanted it to be. Now, when the station wagon stopped, there was a craft that was actually had landed, you know, right there, just off the road. It wasn't hidden. It was it had a it had a walkway. It was, you know, very much like, uh, uh, you know, the day the earth is very much like our traditional from what from what the guy described, very traditional sort of flying saucer motif. So what happened then is they the beings who were greys started taking the children out of the car. Now, this is the old days where we had no seat belts and nothing, you know, so there were just there. I think there were four kids in the back seat and they started floating them out the car windows. And um, so then there was a little blip. I think they, 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 they were the kids were trying to protest, but their bodies were knocked out. They couldn't move their bodies. It was uh, and when my and then my guy recalled that he was on a kind of a medical table, and he was looking. And at that point, he had no clothes on at all. And he looked across the room and he saw his older brother. And his older brother was much more conscious than he was, and was crying and protesting. And causing a big, uh, big simus, big, you know, a big scene. Um, so somehow, uh, every the, the children and the adults, everybody got back in the car somehow, and the car mysteriously started. And uh, by that time, uh, it was it was dawn, and then they were they were sort of all put to sleep or just, you know, had the had the uh, you know, the bugaboo put, put on them. They had their memory suppression situation happening. And then they began, they began to come to consciousness around dawn as they were driving on the road. And the family never discussed this together, ever. It was never discussed. It's just, we're not going to talk about that. And um, did they all have the same? Uh, because if you have missing time, then mm -hmm. there's nothing to discuss. Yeah, they all. Had, they right? and, and the and the father um, was was out long before anybody else because he was essentially sort of taken over and drove where they wanted him to drive. Right. Right. And um, and it must have been ab and it was absolutely terrifying when the children were being levitated or pulled out of the car windows and the parents were just just turned off they just sat there now whether the parents were taken in and examined as well i don't know because i my guy didn't see the parents inside the craft but he just did the kids just yeah the kids. it's it's That's it would it would seem 
that way. And um, and so now, do um, we did what? What? Oh man, I can't believe I'm going to ask this question, but I have to. Uh, what classification do we put that in? Is that the seventy percent, or is that the thirty percent kind? And I'm going thirty percent. That's not, he, I, I'm he terrified was afraid. just listening to it. Yeah, yeah. The kids were they, they were the kids were afraid, and um, but nothing painful happened. No probes. Nothing. Uh, n- n- they saw the beings, but weren't really frightened by them. They were, uh, they were your basic zeta reticulites, I'm sure, because they were the mm-hmm. only and and whatever kind of research they were involved in, they did not, they did not hurt these these children at all. But now, what we would do, what we do in that case is um, when, and this is something I'd like your listeners to really understand as well. When we regress someone, and this is also true of past life regression, any t- any type of regression. The person does not need to re-experience any fear or anxiety or negative feelings of any kind. So as soon as I perceive that the person is becoming anxious, I'm looking at their respiration or they describe something to me I am that is maybe disturbing, I immediately make them an observer. And I say, well, you floated out, you're up, you're looking down at all these things. You don't feel any negative emotions, but you can still process the experience. And that's exactly how it works. People can process these experiences, remember everything that happened, and they can do it without terror or without fear. We do not need to make people re-experience fear to release any type of stressors that are clinging to those memories. When I, so I did my regression. uh, It it was great. I did mine for TV. Okay. So we taped it and I didn't know going in if I was able to be regressed. Now, Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah assured me, Many times, by the way, Jimmy, you might be hypnotized right now. Yeah, I, I'm that good. So do you don't don't you work right? And I was oh, okay. don't worry. All right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but for me, and this is what's interesting. This is my experience, and I've I've shared this with everybody. But uh, uh, you'll find this interesting for me. Uh, as we started, now remember, I've got multiple cameras. We're in a studio. We've got production. We've got TV. Uh, everybody l- had to go behind the glass. So out there, it's just Sarah and I and a couple of candles and a fern. Okay? All right? Okay. So we start. Uh, as, as, as I live and breathe, it happened so fast, and I didn't know if I could do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. The next thing that I remember consciously, it felt like the feeling of going off the first ramp of a roller coaster. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, whoo, right. That, that thing, that, that falling feeling. And, and that was it. Mm-hmm. That, 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 and, and, and I remember Sarah, I heard the number two, like loud in my head. And and I said to myself, I'm talking to myself in my head, right? I'm thinking, why are you bringing me out of this? I want to go back. I want to go back. I, it's all I heard. Mm-hmm. He was, you know, doing it's what I've, I've since seen the tapes. And now I know actually what happened. But I only heard the number two. And mm-hmm. that was it. That was the last thing I remember until she brought me out and and um that's that i was so i was so happy that that i did it right yeah. now I, you know i i didn't uh I, I i had a conscious recall and this is leading up to this question i had a conscious recall of everything as i started to unpack it and talk about mm-hmm. it then i started to remember Mm-hmm. All right, but we were doing a TV show, so I didn't want to see the tapes. 
Mm-hmm. I wanted to do the show and then see the tapes live so we could react to it so I could remember it that way. Mm-hmm. But is that the same process with your clients too as well? Do they remember instantly as they are brought out of uh, that state or do they unpack it over time? Well, usually um, they will unpack more, you know, as, as the day goes on, but they, they have memories of, of what we've just recovered. They are aware of what we've they've experienced, but um, generally, it as you described it, it is a process of more and more details coming back as you you know go throughout the next several hours, and that's when I usually have people do. I have them do drawings. I have them do um, you know all kinds of little little things that uh, will um, uh, stimulate the the recall of whatever has gone on if we were not able to discuss it but generally speaking you know i think i think people have a uh, a confusion they think that when they go into hypnosis they're going to be unconscious which is you know like when you're being put out for a surgery or something now i can do that we that's called hypnotic coma or the esdale state but for regression um, because people are talking to us, you know, we're talking back and forth. So we have to have a certain amount of, uh, you know, the neural network, uh, you know, online. So people are in an altered state, definitely. But the job is to keep them uh, in the alpha slash theta state, uh, mm-hmm. because that's where they're going to be uh, accessing um, their memories. And, you know, when we're talking about um, memory suppression from an ET experience, I don't believe that these so-called memory blocks can last longer than about 20 years. I don't think there is such a thing. And even, you know, uh, the, the people that I've talked to have, who have participated in some of these secret space programs, like, you know, Randy Kramer, people who have, um, you know, experienced these types of phenomena have told me that the government and some of these programs that they've been working with the ETs on, the government and ET programs, they have only developed memory uh, suppression that will work for 20 years which is why I think that so many of my clients begin having breakthrough memories in midlife. Most of my clients come to me in in midlife because they have been experiencing a new crop of of breakthrough memories that are now how do them. you how do you separate a delusion? Mm. Well, that's a very good, that is a very, very good question. I think what I, what I try to do um, is before I ever use any hypnosis, and that's for any kind of hypnosis I'm doing, whether it's a, you know, medical thing or whatever it is, um, I have a very long intake and I, I will talk or I used before COVID, I used to see people in person before working with them. That's not always possible now. But uh, I, you know, and I ask for a medical history. Uh, I ask if they're on any medications. And after I got finished with my, you know, my probing questions, I am pretty darn sure if the person is a fantasist or is delusional or if they are a person with genuine experiences. I and and of course for part of that I must rely, you know, on my instinct. Now could someone fool me? I think I've been fooled twice. And mm. and and all these. So I would have to say yes, but I was on to these people immediately as they started into their trips. You know, I I I knew, you know, but I just let them I just let them go through it. You know, just let them go through it. And I brought them out. And okay, thank you very much. Now, mental illness is that's where I was going. Yeah, yeah. that's 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 so. I I think that for those, this includes me. The way that I've always looked at this is that, and I think it's generally accepted uh, with the rest of the world, right? When we're talking about this, 
the concerns of somebody uh, that is actually like seriously troubled uh, mm-hmm. from something else and and thinks it's a causation of this or it's that oh, yeah. and it's just some crazy you know schizophrenic well, world that they're yes, living in it's it's it does happen and people are hearing voices and they're hearing this they, they say i've got a transmitter i've got an implant in my head and you know i i if i have any doubts jimmy i will always err on the side of doing no harm you know um in in we have a very uh, strict you know, a strict uh, code in our scope of treatment as hypnotherapists here in, in, in Canada. I am not legally allowed to work with anyone who has been diagnosed with a mental health issue. And remember that many of these dear people will, will not tell me the truth. You know, I have to have my little radar on. And also just because someone has experienced severe mental health issues does not dismiss the the idea that they may have also had some genuine experiences. Sure, but, sure. But sure, you know, sure. but unfortunately in the, the limitations of what I do, um, I can't really take a mentally unwell person there and do that kind of work with them. Although a psychiatrist can and a mm-hmm. psychologist can, but I'm back in I'm back in university. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Hardy University, and so I will be able to become a member of the College of Psychotherapy, which will allow me a lot of leeway, and um, uh, in that department. Well, but- this is, but here, this is the other concern, and mm-hmm. and and I have to ask you about this. This is the other concern that you don't. I even I go through this with my conversations with people or I'm taking live Mm -hmm. phone calls or I'm Mm -hmm. at a conference, right? I don't want to be the catalyst to somebody taking a step over the edge. Oh yeah. I I don't want to be that person. I I, I, I don't want to confirm or, or anything. I I, I just don't. Well, I'm with you in that. You know, first do no harm. It's, it's, uh, and you know, when you are at as many public events as you are at, which is a lot all the time, there are going to be a certain percentage of people that come to these conferences. I know I speak at a lot of them too, that are, that are unstable. There will be a certain percentage of those people at conferences for this esoteric subject matter that are unstable. And, um, I, I, I don't now, I really don't have any fears about making a big mistake and because my, my radar, all my years of experience and my, and working also with severely mentally unwell people in, you know, in the, in the, uh, um, state mental hospital, you know, I've, I'm, I mean, I've, I've, my instincts are very good. So if I have any doubts, I leave well enough alone. Now, I also don't hang these people out to dry because I have a little network of psychiatrists and psychologists who are open to the idea of experiences. So I will simply refer these people on to someone who can truly help them legally and can also also provide medication or whatever's you know whatever's required so i don't just hang these poor people out to dry i if i can't work with them i find somebody that can work with them the uh the other part of this is i you need i understand your criteria right that that you you would like to have at least a partial memory foundation as a starting mm-hmm. point. Yes. Um, I didn't do that by choice with Sarah when we did our regression. Mm-hmm. I told Sarah, I don't know. I don't want to know. But let's see what happens. Mm-hmm. And I, I trust you. Um, and so I didn't want any leading thoughts. I didn't want any mm-hmm. leading questions. I didn't want it because we're doing this for TV too, as well. I'm hanging all of my stuff out to dry in front of everybody. Right. This is was, like, was le- this a le- past life regression, Jimmy? Was this a no, past no, life? Oh, no, oh, I see. No. Okay. 
No, I just let her. I no, no, no. Okay. I I don't know. Um, the past life. You know why I? Okay, a, a couple of comments. I feel like uh, the table just turned around. You are now the host. I'm the guest. But <laughs> but 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 here's the situation with that. Um, I I wanted to gain the experience of the therapy, so I knew what I was talking about when I would discuss this in a conversation or a show in the future. That's the first thing, because I had never mm -hmm. done it before. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I'm asking questions about stuff I, I truly know nothing about. I can read about it, but I wanted to go through the process. That's number one. Number two, I wanted to see if there was something that I had to say mm -hmm. that I didn't know about mm -hmm. and how would that be accessed? Well, that happened too as well. And mm -hmm. the stuff that came out of my mouth, I was pretty shocked about, mm -hmm. but, but th there was that part. And then there's the third part. I'm okay with that, but uh, past life regression, I don't too many past lives. It reminds me of, um, of, uh, that movie defending your life. Oh, yeah. Okay, so in the, the movie, past life pavilion, remember, yeah, yeah, the past life pavilion, right? Yeah. I, that that would be me. I, I, I would be the guy getting chased across the savannah. I was just thinking about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I don't I, too many, too many, too many past uh, lives. People are Cleopatra. Right. Or, yeah. you know what I mean? And, well, I've and, never you know. had that. I've never had um, a famous person show up in all of these years. Uh, so most of the time, in fact, sometimes, you know, it, it is very much like the past life pavilion. Like I had one gal, again, a teacher, brilliant teacher. And I, I usually try to visit three lifetimes if I'm doing a regression. I try to, but again, it depends on how people process and how much information they give me. But we got, I, there were three lives of hers and they were like non-verbal. They were like primitive, primitive Wow, people uh, just they could hardly even form words. So she was telling me about what she was seeing and using language, but uh, I, it was not at all what I expected. And uh, I said, well, you know, that's, but usually people hear what they are supposed to hear. I don't always, when I'm doing a past life regression, I don't always say, you know, let's go uh, visit your most recent lifetime. I don't, I don't, oh, I don't do that. I, we go where uh, the person wants to go. Because the person, the subject, has all that information. And the, the big reason for having a past life regression is to look at a pattern of behavior that maybe you're re-experiencing and yet and you can now maybe adjust it or stop it or learn from it. So that's, you know, it's all it's all growth and learning. And this is the cruel school. And um, you know, those of us that are here right now, a lot of us are here. Um, to witness the great experiment, you know, the transition of uh, consciousness into another dimension, which I think is what, you know, we are all heading towards. We are, you know, a, a term I like to use yourself, Jimmy, we are midwives of disclosure is what we are. So get your gloves on, get scrubbed up and get in that delivery room. And nah, man, I see. Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I and here's here's my other take. I, that the past lives, I'm going to leave in the closet. Okay. I don't think I'm going to go there. That's me, and I know, yeah. I, and I'm fascinated with it. I am, but for me, I just don't need. I don't have that need to know. Then there's uh, no reason. There's no reason I, to go into such an exploration. If if there was something that you needed to know, you would have the urge to do the exploration. Now, here's the other part. Physically and mentally, I was drained. Mm -hmm. I did not 
expect that part of it. So we did the regression the day before the taping of the TV show. Okay. And, and I get back to my hotel and I am, I'm unpacking my head. Number one, Mm -hmm. number Mm -hmm. two, I was spent. Mm -hmm. And so I thought to myself, so, you know, I got a good night's rest. We had a great TV uh, taping the next day and all that was fine. But would I do it again? I don't think I could do that a couple of times a year. That's a once a year e ticket to <laughs> Disneyland. Maybe never again. You know, it's it was it was like that for me. Is it the same uh, with your clients, or do they do they come back and and do multiple sessions in a year? Um, yes, but I don't um, do regression. Very, I mean, I don't uh, do regression for one individual very often or close together. I think it's unhealthy to have too much of a focus on, you know, we're we're supposed to be, you know, we have to be, we have to stick to uh, linear time to a certain degree. And um, uh, I think people can become too uh, obsessed or focused on, uh, you know, their past life situations or it, it's, it, it, it's, it's a fine line. It's an information tool, but I don't think it should be overused. But people do get very exhausted after one of these processes. That's that's a very common. I mean, I don't like people to drive. For instance, if they come to my treatment space or if it's a clinic, I would I will usually, if I'm doing a metaphysical process, I will insist that that person has somebody to drive them. Because oh, oh, for sure, for sure. Yeah, when yeah. I, I walked out, so I, I get up. Uh, you'll love this. So I get up, and I was like, man, whoo, how long was that? I was thinking it was 10 minutes, by the way. Oh, I knew yeah. That we, Distor- I knew time that, distortion. That yeah, time yeah, yeah, distortion. Yeah, 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 yeah. I knew that we had discussed this, the production team and the network and stuff, that we needed about 10 minutes of material for the TV show. So that was in the back of my mind, right? So anyway, I, I was like, how long was that? Because you were under for one hour and 11 minutes. I was like, yeah, what? Yeah. So anyway, I get up. My fingers were numb because mm-hmm. I had them interlocked on my chest. Mm-hmm. My, you know, I'm well, lucky blood, I didn't have a, Yeah. Oh, your I, I blood pressure this. goes down in hypnosis. You, you totally, get your totally. hands fall asleep and your feet fall asleep. Yeah. Everything fell asleep. Mm-hmm. So I get up. Not not understanding any of this, and I walk. I have to go to the bathroom. I go out into the hallway, and Leslie, I put my hand on the wall. <laughs> put my hand on the wall. I was like, "Whoo!" I was alone. Nobody yeah. saw me do this. Yeah, I'm telling you, my honest state that I was in was that hand on the wall. Whoo! Yeah. Yeah, man. Whoa. And yeah, there was driving. Oh, no, 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 no. no. Talking is hard, let alone. I know doing anything like that. And we also, you know, we don't really like to keep people in a regression state in a trance longer, much. I will never keep anyone in longer than an hour and a half. That's absolute tops. I like to, I like an hour better because it's very hard for people to reintegrate after that. After if, if you, if you keep them in that deep hypnosis too long, it's not optimum. They'll have a hard time getting back into reality and, and they will feel so stoned because you get an endorphin release too. There's a big, you know, the pineal gland is somehow involved in all of this. And I think DMT is also released actually. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think so too yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, I, the, the memories that were recalled and there was one that was specific, I'm not going to get into it. We have to take a break, but I had no clue, none. And after the session, it, it, it I, now I've got it all. I, I, I have, it's, it's unlocked. It's yeah. like crazy. I, it's like, mm-hmm. I, it's, and it was sitting there. You know, yeah. and it's like weird. And 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 one last thing, and then we'll take a break. Um, my higher self, which I had no idea I had one, by the way, didn't mm-hmm. know, didn't know, didn't know. 
And when that, when that, I'm going to use the word crap, when that crap started, and I'm talking to myself in the third person, mm-hmm. and I'm, and, and, and now I, re, I, I didn't remember this when I came out, but I remember feeling confused during the session. Mm-hmm. Who are you? And what are you doing here in my head? Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I swear to God, I yeah. swear that was my thought. And and yeah. and I'm listening. And so when I went back and watched the tapes, and I'm listening to that person talk with words that I don't use, mm-hmm. words that I still don't use. You know, a, a form of communicate, a form of. And a, a thought process that, and I've done thousands of shows. I know mm-hmm. how I talk. I know how I present. I know my processes. But that person that came out, that higher self during the session, I I had no clue. Yeah. None. Well, None. people connect with their higher selves. They connect sometimes with spirit guides. Uh, sometimes they connect with and what I would have to call angelic beings or maybe even ultra terrestrials. There's uh, a lot that goes on spiritually. And, you know, often when I work with someone more than once, we'll be able to go on some very fascinating trips together. And one of the things that um, seems to happen now um, and with some experiencers that I have worked with regularly is it's almost more like channeling. First, you have to get the idea in your head that time isn't really real and the, uh, and communication with evolved beings can happen instantly and it can happen anytime. And so um, what I will put someone in trance and they will perhaps connect with an ET being with which they have a relationship with. And, um, uh, and so at that point, you know, I can even ask questions. I can say, you know, can you ask uh, so-and-so mm-hmm. uh, blah, blah, blah. If they, if they incarnate into different bodies as well, I mean, whatever, whatever's in my head. And, and then I get, I get an answer and the person will answer me in using vocabulary that they don't normally use. Sometimes they will sound very different, a little bit like uh, Bashar, if you've ever seen Daryl Anka, you know, do his full I, track. I, I, I host all of his events. Oh, well, you know, I, I'm crazy about him, you know. Yeah, and, he's amazing. Uh, and um, I completely accept what he is doing, and I have been a, a, a fan for many 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 years so it's a little bit it can be a little bit like that and so there are a couple of people i'm working with right now and when they come to see me uh they are et experiencers it's not so much to to explore their encounters but it's about real-time communication Oh, so I that's, love that. I love that's that. pretty. I love that. That's pretty fascinating. It does, not everybody that. gets gets to that point, but it does happen. And uh, and I record it. And um, a lot of times, the person who is the subject doesn't really remember asking and and answering the questions. Like they'll have a very uh, uh, in and out memory of what actually did transpire. So they're in an altered state too. They're, uh, you know, it's the speed of thought. I think that, you know, I think probably, I think there's a good chance that every advanced culture, if you want to use the term advanced, because we're still, you know, a bunch of Neanderthals as far as I'm concerned, but any advanced culture, we are, any advanced culture probably has to do a dance with technology uh, about over atomic power, because as Stanton Friedman used to say, if you can, if you're, if you can figure out how the sun works, then you're going to figure out nuclear power. So you know, there's that, and then the use of this kind of technology, which is very close to the speed of thought. It's it's like training wheels. I think, I I think we can from passing through this technology and not losing ourselves in the entertainment or the period aspects of it, it is acting as a, as a kind of training that will allow us to segue into a far more intuitive telepathic uh, space. And um, I think all 
I think all cultures, if they got to a certain point, have to deal with the balance of technology. It seems logical to me. And, uh, you know, hopefully when we when I do regressions with people who have had lives in Lemuria and Atla- and of course, Atlantis That's where I'm going next. Um, oh. I, I need, I need, listen, I need to take a break. Let's okay. take a break. When we come back, uh, let's let's talk a little Atlantis, Lemuria and, of course, Egypt and, and Peru. Yeah, and all that other baby. Stuff. All we'll right. That. Our guest tonight, Leslie Mitch- Mitchell Clark is with us. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is Fade to Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to get your alerts and access to over 2,000 videos. Click that subscribe button right now. JimmyChurchRadio.com and get the Fade to Black official podcast. 2,000 episodes, all of them commercial free for just $2 a month. This is Jimmy Church. Please visit and explore Egypt this October 3rd through the 14th, 2024 with Billy, Elizabeth, myself, and very special guest and the number one podcaster in the world, Sean Kelly. It's simple to do. Just go to ForbiddenKnowledge.com and click on Upcoming Tours or click on the link below. We'll see you there. Watch Into the Vortex on Gaia TV. It's fade to black for the screen. Simple to do. Go to Gaia.com, search Jimmy Church, or click on the link below. Follow Fade to Black on Twitter at J Church Radio. Get all of the show updates every single day. It's it, it's now called X, but who cares? How you doing? Jimmy Church here. Special announcement. Get your Fade to Black t-shirts. That's right. Help support the show. Help support everything that we do over here. We've got two t-shirts. We've got two ways to get them. And right now, if you get a Game Changer membership for a limited time, you will get Fade to Black Blend Coffee with your Game Changer membership. That's right. We have two t-shirts. We have the original, the classic Fade to Black t-shirt. You know you want one. 
Post a picture, send it to us. We'll put it in our Fade to Black gallery. And we've got the new official Fade to Black t-shirt drawn by Michael Oming. Two t-shirts, two ways to get them. Get yours today. Everything is in stock. Everything gets autographed. Everything includes shipping. And you're going to get a tracking number. And with a Game Changer membership, you get an email to me. You get unlimited commercial-free downloads of the show. Those are uploaded every single night after the show to the website. So don't delay. Get your Fade to Black t-shirt today. Go Backley Tappy. Go to jimmychurchradio.com and become a fade or not. Get a membership. That's right. Everything is commercial free. You have access to downloads and you get to call yourself a fade or not. River Moon Coffee, makers of the fade to black blend. Truly the best coffee on planet Earth. Just visit rivermoonwellness.com or, or their Amazon store. It's all simple to do. You can check out the Fade to Black blend, the Game Changer blend, or any of their Black Moon Wellness products. It's the only coffee I drink. It is the best, and it's Doc. Again, rivermoonwellness.com. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tonight, Leslie Mitchell Clark is with us, and we're talking about uh, hypnotherapy of the alien variety. But I'm holding in my hand right here, Fade to Black Blend Coffee. Get your Game Changer membership right now, and you will get this. It's the best coffee in the world, and I just got a nice, fresh shipment in for all of you Game Changers it's the best. Uh, I did a, a fader fact today that uh, Coca-Cola uh, bought up all of the URLs that have ah, A-H-H, ah, like I do, right? They, they bought up all of the URLs with the word ah up to 62 H's. <laughs> Uh, what are you going to do? So uh, how did I find that out? I tried to get it. Yeah. Ah. Leslie. <laughs> Is, you, you know, the, the, the beauty about this show, all right, is that I don't wear a mask. You get me. That's, That's it. Right. That's it. The, there right. is no mask. There is no mask. That's it's right. coffee. It's coffee, music, and them aliens. You know, <laughs> <laughs> that's my show. And 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 I am able to. It is such a freeing thing, much like hypnotherapy, in that I do this every night, and I am able to uh, not be connected to the internet. I'm not mm -hmm. on social media. I'm doing the old fashioned thing. I'm having mm -hmm. a conversation with somebody. Yeah. yeah. And and that's that's yeah. that's a lot uh, uh you know that that's what you do. Now, let's let's have some fun for a second. Let's let's talk Atlantis. Oh yeah. And the, and the reason for that is uh and I don't want to drag on here. But when I go to uh, uh an ancient site you know, it, it could be here in the United States, but it could be in, in another country. But when you go there, there's something, there's a sense. It's not everywhere that you go, but you will, um, I shouldn't say you will, it's not a definite, but it's my own experience that there'll be some place, this thing, and it sneaks up on you and you're like, huh, I've been here. I don't know when, but this is very familiar to me. And and so I, I, I feel that our DNA 
is just storing. We have to remember one thing. Our DNA came from our parents. Their DNA came from theirs. Their DNA, and, and on and on and on and on and on and on to the beginning of time. It's that simple. That information is passed that you know, and and mm-hmm. and getting to that is is the trick, right? But I think that we all have it, don't we? There's genetic memory, absolutely. I think there are memories that are in this, and and the body holds trauma. We know that the body holds traumatic memories. Um, uh, so certainly. Um, it, it's always a question of nature or nurture, but I, I will say one thing, Jimmy, because I think that the episodes of um, encounters, contactees, experiencers, this is something that is intergenerational. Um, even Kathy Marden, I don't think she'd mind me telling this, you know, not only did her Aunt Betty of Barney and Betty Hill have other experiences, but I believe that her mother had experiences. So there is a a, a genetic component. Um, now, you know, there are also there are so many different types of beings that are uh, interacting with us, um, and uh, I would say that there are an awful lot that look very similar to us, indistinguishable. And uh, those would be, you know, the Lyrans, the um, uh, anyone for the Lyran system. The Anunnaki are considered part of the Lyran system. And um, uh, as as Bashar has said, you know, there's the Yael who will be one of the first beings to make open contact with us because we're like cousins. We share DNA. So one has to wonder when we're talking about Atlantis or Lemuria, two super cultures that were multiracial, racial, one in the Pacific uh, Ocean, the other in the Atlantic Ocean. The Atlantic Ridge is still there. You know, uh, birds are still migrating and trying to land on the on the mountains of Atlantis. You know, it, it, it's it's there's no question that it exists and it exists fairly, I believe, fairly close to where Plato said it existed. Um, the, but, outside of outside of Gibraltar. Yeah, the outside of the pillars of Hercules, which is which, yeah, was, yeah and, and and certainly, um, it, but it was a massive uh, uh, continent, and it extended all the way. Uh, parts of it were in our Ire- extended from Ireland all the way across the ocean. In fact, Ireland at one time and and our own uh, uh, Newfoundland and Labrador were like torn away from Ireland. It was one, uh, it, it was connected there. There's a landmass that was connected. So, you know, I, there's a, there's a lot, there are a lot of wonderful speakers that speak very eloquently about, uh, you know, the, the events or the cataclysms that most likely um, incited the ruin of uh, Lemuria and Atlantis. And I'm not sure it all, it had anything to do with um, uh, you know, the, the, the Christian biblical idea of, you know, God wanted to, um, uh, you know, erase humanity from the earth. But I think uh, I think it's very possible that the I think it's probable, not only possible, that the Atlanteans and the Lemurians were evolved beings that had ongoing relationships with other ETs. I think this is something that has been part of the experience here on Earth for for millennia. And uh, of course, you know, we we have incredible information from Zachariah Sitchin about uh, what went on with the Anunnaki, uh, what went on with their their hunt for gold to repair their atmosphere, uh, their sort of, uh, you know, Island of Dr. Moreau approach that they had going where they were up upgrading, you know, uh, uh, Denisovans and, and, um, and the Enderthals to finally uh, eventually arrive at the Homo sapiens sapien. This is, this is, this is a fact. This didn't happen naturally. No one's going to find a missing link, the so-called missing link, because it didn't happen that way. <laughs> it just didn't happen that what, way. What I find uh, interesting is that Plato's Atlantis came from information from Egypt. From Solon, yeah. Yeah, from yeah, 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 yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and when you look at the origin stories of so many different cultures, 
uh, it's not just Egypt, right? You can no. go into Mesopotamia and you mm -hmm. can look at the Sumerian text and mm -hmm. you can go into China and Japan and Asia. And you, this, this origin story is repeated over and over again. It is. It is. And it, it, it points <laughs> to, with cultures that could not have, if we believe the dogma of history, by the way, but could not have had contact with each other uh, that that long ago. But yet their story, their origin story is all very similar. Yes, there there are commonalities. There were uh, there was the Younger Dryas event, you know, of course, the Great Ice Age. There was most likely a meteor situation that triggered the Younger Dryas event. So there there are commonalities. You know, the 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 ocean it was it, what is it they now say a four hundred feet lower than what it is today. Oddly, so entire um, uh, cities exist cleopatra's you know was a herculaneum cleopatra's town is under the water so we we are going to as as our technology evolves and as we become more facile with lidar and some of these other more non-invasive ways to uh conduct archaeology uh, i think it's just going to be one fantastic discovery after another and just one little footnote about where you were talking interestingly enough about you know trade and communication and how did how did beings that were so separated, how were they able to um, uh, share the same mythology, essentially? Well, you know, they have done some incredible research on the mummies of Egypt. And uh, the, the Old Kingdom mummies are loaded with cocaine and mm. tobacco. <laughs> yeah, now, there is, there is no, which absolutely means there had to have been trade with the ancient uh, peoples of the South America. There had to be. They had to, they, uh, whether maybe they use lighter than airships, maybe they use balloons. I think they had flying technology. We've seen pictures of it in, in, in uh, various uh, boss reliefs in Egypt. We've seen pictures of, of craft, clearly. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's a mystery. And the Egyptians, I, I, believe uh, we're pretty much a colony of Atlantis. I think a lot of the, um, I think the pharaonic line really began with survivors of the Atlantean uh, tragedy. And, uh, and, you know, the interesting thing, along with finding all this cocaine and all this tobacco, um, in the recent DNA work is proving, and this is very uncomfortable for like Dr. Hawass, who's been in and out of favor so many times. I don't never know whether he's in jail or on a dig, you know, but anyway, he's, but you know, they, the, these hardcore guys don't like the idea that the ancient mummies were in fact European. They don't like it, <laughs> but I'm, I, I'm sorry. Ar Ar Armenian. Yeah, uh, which would be even scarier. It, yeah. here, the the stuff that they will find in my mummified body in five thousand years, <laughs> curl your toes. <laughs> you, you know they, <laughs> they don't even need to mummify my body. No, I'm already I'm full, I'm full of so many. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am full of all the chemicals. Um, well, but, <laughs> but, Starting with the shit we ate as kids. I mean, my yes, mother, oh, my mother actually sure. thought that frozen vegetables were better than fresh vegetables. And if something didn't taste right, she said, "Oh, well, let's just just let me throw some MSG on this." <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Extra MSG. So we survived somehow. Nitrates think about, and... <laughs> think about all the hot dogs, right? I've got oh, enough. God. And I'm from New York City. Oh my God. I, <laughs> I know, I know. Well, that hot dog water, I think that's what gives us super immunity in New York. It's that hot dog water. You I survived think a, that. I think yeah, there's a absolutely. positive to it. I think it strengthens the immune system. So yep, 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 yep. <laughs> when I got back from Egypt. Uh, uh, the the first trip that I took, I got I got the Pharaoh's revenge. Okay, oh. I did for, like mm -hmm. like for real, for real, and it lasted for a while. I don't want to deter anybody. But you you got to go, but I'm telling you, I have not been sick since, 
And uh, I've traveled the world, and nothing is. I have got the immunity of a pit bull. Yeah. I'm not scared of anything now. No, you know, don't so. be. You you so, pass through the you've passed through the fire you've uh, you've passed through the pain sticks. <laughs> you, you know the thought of um, what I don't want to sound like some old dude, but seriously, the stuff that we did when we were kids, right? The stuff that we drank oh, off a garden hose all the time. You know, I, I can remember the taste of it now. No, yeah. no, no seat belts. No, no, seat belts. no supervision. My my dad would like whistle for us, and we'd come home, or when the street lights came on. And, uh, and there seriously. was uh, t- t- today. Uh, uh, I rode my uh, my bike, my Harley out. I, I took a took a ride to this lake, and there, and there's this picnic area. And so I pulled down and there was a couple of other, uh, riders there and a couple of bikers. And, and so we, you know, we're talking and we're talking, the conversation goes to what we're talking about right now. The amount of, uh, death defying acts we did when we were kids. Now <laughs> the thought, if, if I caught my kids today, but <laughs> we had, uh, we, if this, I'm not planting a flag here. This went on in every single block of every single neighborhood of the United States. But bike ramp in front of the house. And all of us kids, all summer long, man, lined yep. up with our bikes. Yeah. To ride, you know, the bike ramp is down, the jump is at the bottom of the street down an incline so we could build up speed. And poof, right? And every, well, there were some successful landings. Most of them <laughs> ended really Ouch. bad. Yeah. Ouch. Oh, man. Just <laughs> right off. And, and the thought of, I just, I, I cannot believe, you know, and uh, what's wrong with that? Today, it, you know, bike helmets and pads mm. and training wheels and, and this and that and safety first. And no, man, push your push, push him down the hill. <laughs> you know, and, and that's that's uh, anyway, anyway. Yeah, they're, they're, I know it was a different it was a different situation, different it, it, things have changed so rapidly. Uh, and you know, I like you probably, I mean, we had, we had one phone and that was on the wall in the kitchen. There were no other phones. There was no privacy. There were no teenagers hanging on the phones. We, you know, it, that was it. That was the home phone. And, yeah, uh, it, 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 when the phone rang, you picked it up. Yes. Right. You, you, you wondered who could be calling. Who could it and, be? Right. Now today. <laughs> That phone rings. Nobody picks that up. Nah. No. No. It's crazy. It's, it's a, not going to pick whole, it up. Not going to pick it up. <laughs> it's a whole well, other world. It's a it's a it's a balancing act, and and uh, you know we went through <clears throat> a lot of stuff awfully quickly again because I was talking a little bit earlier about the Truman deal, and the uh, later the Eisenhower deal. We got a lot of technology. Maybe some of it a little bit prematurely but uh you know the integrated circuits um uh you know fiber optics um uh, velcro <laughs> all of that comes from the deal with the Zeta reticulites that was made you know after the um the so-called roswell crash which involved i believe three craft not one and uh there were survivors and um a deal was made and that was the beginning of an unsupervised, uh, unlimited kind of secret space program. That was the very beginning of our military industrial complex. So when this technology came came from the ETs to the military, they just parceled it out to, you know, like the Hughes Skunk Works, you guys take that. You And I'm, I'm pretty convinced that those... Um, individuals that were involved with reverse engineering these these uh exotic uh items they i believe they probably thought it was russian technology they probably did it was the beginning of the cold war and um 
I I think that that was that was how all of this was managed. If anybody's like real, any of your listeners out there are particularly interested in this period of time, there's a great book by the late uh, uh, Philip Corso, um, uh, Colonel Corso, I believe, and uh, it's called The Day After Roswell, and it really goes into great detail about how the military developed what they called the Department of Foreign Technology. <laughs> Boy, it was foreign, all right. <laughs> so. I, I, yeah, I'm, total, I'm totally with you on that. And I have often wondered, uh, let's talk about your clients for a second. Um, when we, we talk about, you know, like, you know, the great John Mack and, Mm -hmm. and, Mm -hmm. and Bud, of course, Mm -hmm. the, uh, the, there must be a commonality that something clicked with John Mack for him to go, okay, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's something going on here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and th- there has to be, and so when we bring up something like Atlantis, is, is there is there a commonality in your clients that you know th- they don't know each other, right? But they're repeating something that for you you notice um, uh, over time uh, a commonality between these different sessions. Um, it is not unusual for i think i can answer that a couple ways but it's not unusual for experiencers to have lived lifetimes on other planets as yes it's not it all because apparently in our soul group you know we we incarnate right alongside many other species that are very close to us and there are some people who um long for uh who who f- always feel like they're in the wrong place and they have regretted incarnating here and they long to be home so there there is an aspect of that and um and those people will often recount to me um uh, stories of being um a long lived et being who was maybe present here during the Atlantean times. So uh, we, there is, there is crossover. Well, that's um, interesting. That's there really is crossover. And there are beings that are exceedingly long lived compared to ourselves. We certainly know that about the Anunnaki, but, you know, and of course in the, in the, in the old Testament, you know, and Methuselah, I think it's, those are literal figures. I think those Old Testament characters had special DNA and were very tall, They're that tall and, and, and blue eyed often. And, and not to say that they were not um, ethnically Semitic. I'm just saying that there were, there were different DNA strains that were still quite predominant uh, from the Anunnaki in the biblical times. And um, and those people were very long lived. But yes, it's not unusual for me to to be working with someone who's an experiencer, and they will talk about being on other planets and living um, another lifetime there. And um, and how also, do they? Uh, can I? Uh, yeah. In the short time that we have left, um, how do they? Uh, how do they describe these planets? What did they see? What was it like? I think that many planets that sustain human life, or, or I should say, I don't want to say human life, uh, you know, bipedal uh, humanoid life, have to have a certain um, uh, uh, similarity. It's like in, in Star Trek, they talk about a class M planet. I think water and some type of air, some type of breathable. They, these beings have lungs. They, they, there are there have to be certain similarities. Now, every once in a while, I hear about something pretty far out, even for me. Uh, for instance, I've heard some clients, uh, and this would be more in a past life regression. Uh, what I'm going to tell you, but I've had people in a regression and they will begin recalling a life uh, maybe as an aquatic being. So I have 
experienced that before, where there were beings that were sort of like mermaids and mermen uh, who, who are aquatic. Um, and um, I have heard um, also uh, stories of people who were in uh, alien bodies that were very much like, um, um, oh, there's a type of bug that I'm trying, they're, they're insectoids. You know they're insectoids, and 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 that's very, you know. But they're but they're beings that are full of love. They're very loving beings too. So it's a it's it's very it's very interesting. I think as mammalians, we have a lot of trouble with beings if they would evolve from either a reptilian or an insectoid line of development. I think, you know, I mean, look at us, we can barely get along with each other and, and we're all, you know, human beings just in different colors and sizes, right? So, but I think that part of our, uh, our, our problem in becoming galactic citizens is that we have issues, uh, prejudicial issues about certain types of beings. We're uncomfortable. We do. We do. We do. We're we uncomfortable do. with them. We're uncomfortable with them, and they, that's when they go to a lot. And and for instance, speaking of insectoids, I'm just going to for just a moment. They, um, um, I've I've uh, worked with individuals who were you know regressed to a life as an insectoid being, and they live underground, and they have hatcheries. So there are things that are kind of you know insect like but yet they're bipedal and they're geniuses and they're considered the genetic geniuses of the galaxy um uh, or are part of the galaxy anyway so the insectoids show up a lot in people's encounters particularly um uh, when when we're dealing with children and they're doing a lot of examinations i don't mean painful examinations mostly just observances but the the um and i've heard I've heard my clients call these beings the brown doctors. In fact, I've heard more than one uh, client call them that. I think they might refer to them as that when they're on the craft or something. Mm. So the the brown doctors never really show their they never show their faces if they can. They're always on either side of you because they're so conscious about upsetting or frightening uh, children and adults. So they they take uh, you know some ETs take great pains to not frighten us and that and we misinterpret that i think many times we misinterpret their of their, course their, why wouldn't why their wouldn't motives we? yeah why wouldn't we uh today i did a report now this is this is now think about this for a second canadian scientists accidentally found out by accident that bumblebees can survive underwater for seven days. <laughs> now, so wow. now, 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 now think about that for a second. Think about that bumblebee that, that accidentally proved this where they're like, dude, no, 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 not under the water. You're waterboarding, yeah. right? Bumblebees. Yeah. So then yeah. to prove the theory, they took 148 queen bumblebees and submerged them for a week. Oh. They took a, a 148 queen bumblebees and had them out of the water to check right so anyway now wait well, let's 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 unpack that for a minute that sucks but right if you're the bumblebee and and and, and now let's let's take et for example mm -hmm. if that's what we're doing with bumblebees and et is going we how do i say this we were not going to make sure that the bumblebees were unstressed right right right, right can right, you imagine right. can you imagine what kinds of things have gone on in the secret space program with um you know vivisection and god knows what they have done to 
beings that just happen to be here, land here, crash here. You know, it's, uh, I know there have been many, many of them have just died. You know, they, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, one thing I was going to, in speaking of varieties of aliens and also past life regression for just a moment, <coughs> um, you know how there's a, there are certain commonalities of experiences and most people when they cross over, when they, uh, out of our physical life into a higher vibratory realm, which we would call heaven, <coughs> they um, go before a council. And this is not to be insulted or criticized, but it's to take a, a loving look at your last life so that you can retain, you know, experience and knowledge from that. Well, I started asking people when they got to their councils, I, I started asking them just out of curiosity, can you describe to me what the what your council members look like? And then I started hearing with great frequency about ETs of all description that we could think of uh, sitting on people's councils. Why not? Why not? Uh, we're in this. We're in the soul groups now. It also would seem <coughs> that beings that are uh, of a certain uh, evol evolution can move freely into what we call heaven which one must assume now it's just a higher vibratory rate that is non-physical, it's light matter, whatever whatever one wishes to call it. Um, maybe they're bilocating. There's a lot of bilocating. There are a lot of species that don't bother to get into craft because they can just, they can present, they can ask or project so convincingly that you think you are seeing a physical being. So there's all kinds of stuff going on. A whole lot of different types of phenomena are happening. But the, one of the, I think that they are waiting for us to just basically get it together and stop our hateful behaviors and fix our planet. That's the, one of the big messages that the experiences are getting. And they have been getting since Betty and Barney Hill. You're the stewards of the planet. Fix the planet. Care for the animals. Care for your fellow man. It's pretty simple, really. Yeah, it is. It, it, it is very it's pretty, basic. Pretty it's damn very... simple. The keys for happiness and a, and a better world are very simple. Unfortunately, we, you know, the Anunnaki didn't just didn't just contribute DNA, they contributed some very unfortunate warlike tendencies, I believe. I believe they can they had a lot to do with with greed and um, you know other kinds of questionable, morally questionable behavior. You know, they were they were not perfect. They were not gods. They were not gods and they were imperfect beings and we are their progeny essentially well, dna is dna mm -hmm. the dna of a banana is is just the same as ours right yeah yeah a little snip snip here and there and you've got a dolphin you've mm -hmm. got a chimpanzee you've got an elephant you've got a goat you've got a cat you've got a dog right you've got uh, all of the different types of of genetic uh uh, uh formations uh, mm -hmm. that that happened but it, it, it's the same throughout the universe and that's it dna is dna i believe it's it. the same yeah it's the same yeah. everywhere and and some alien that steps off of the, their dna is going to be very similar to ours with a couple of little have you, seen, have you seen the movie uh, valerian Luke Besson. Oh, yes, I have. Yes, I have. I love Luke Besson. Yes, I have seen it. it, it it's such a great movie. And at the beginning of the movie uh, with David Bowie, right, uh, as the soundtrack, uh, the ISS is is now giant, right? It's out there. And it the first E.T. pulls up. Well, Luke Besson, he does it so well. Um, he parades through all of these different species of yeah. ET that are shaking hands with humans over time, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Anything that you can imagine, it, it's like really, but the, the, the trip about that parade is that 
all of the DNA is the same. It's just a little yeah. different. Yep. But we're all the same throughout that's the right. galaxy. That's, that's, that's right. it. And we have to we have to find our seat at the table, you know, and that's we that's do. It. We do. And I think not only do we have DNA that we can currently see and 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 deal with, but I think we also have sympathetic DNA. We have etheric DNA that is part of our astral body. So, you know, I think it's more, uh, a little more complex than, than, than we understand now, but I think that is all going to be part of our great, you know, illumination. And now there has been, so I don't know what you think about this, Jimmy, but I've heard this, not from, not from my clients, but I've, I've, I've heard this, that because the Anunnaki were, were threatened by how quickly the humans evolved and how smart they actually were, that somehow our DNA was, uh, or uh, was truncated so that we would not evolve past a certain point. Well, we all know that that has got to be bullshit because, excuse me, because uh, the brain is is plastic and subjective and can heal and, and uh, do amazing things. So I don't know how that could possibly have been arranged, but that is something that I keep hearing about from various um, uh, folks that are very knowledgeable in the ancient astronaut world that somehow our DNA was truncated and we are waking up. The pineal gland is waking up. It's supposed to be, it should be the size of a grape. It's the size of a rice grain in most of us. Yeah, the uh, the when you look at the science part of this, now um, I we have the work of Sitchin and others. We have the Sumerian text. We have the Sumerian kings list. We have, uh, historically, we have stuff that we can reference on this. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. the science side of it, the anthropology side of it, when you look at this, this is the fact. Homo sapien sapien just appeared 200,000 mm-hmm. years ago. That's right. And like Venus on up. the half shell. That's right. That's Hello. right. That's right. <laughs> and and the the crazy part about that is Homo sapien sapien has got 46 chromosome pairs. Primates have 48. Yeah. That's right. We have two less cra- That's a lot of information by the way. Yeah. And and so uh, a chromosome pair 3 and 4 were fused. Ah. And, and 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 brought us down. Now that that's scientific fact. That is mm-hmm. not, you know, pseudoscience fringe mm-hmm. out of the box. Mm-hmm. You know, no, no, no. That that's fact. Yeah. Nobody knows how that happened. Yeah. And technically, it should be chimpanzees creating uh, cell phones. Yeah. Not us. Right. Right. That's right. a bizarre, and so that could be what you're referencing right now. That could have yes. been the, the the change that that happened. And I don't. When I talk to anthropologists about this, Leslie, they go, "It just happened." <laughs> that that can't be your answer. No, well, nothing an just happens. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, and why why do we have different blood groups? Why is O negative, which I am, by the way, the oldest blood group, the first blood group? Is it? It makes it is. It is. They know when the different blood groups came in. They know this is. This is also scientific fact. It's not anything woo woo. They know that O negative is the first um, humanoid blood type that they've been able to identify, and um, but nowhere else in nature can there be a situation where a mother's blood would try to expel a child that had another blood type you know that's uh, and that's what happens if you don't have if you don't have a gamma globulin shot or whatever your body if your care if your child is not the same blood type as yourself your body will try to eject that baby and nowhere else in nature do we find this kind of strange uh blood type behavior and it's also said that the anunnaki also had uh, copper based blood which is why they looked um vaguely blue they had a bluish cast to their skin and their blood was copper based which is interesting 
but this O negative blood is old. And um, there are high, high percentages of it in among the, um, the Druze people, um, Irish people, um, Celtic people have a very high percentage of it as well. So hmm. I think any place where the An Anunnaki were, we're going to find pockets of uh, high concentrations of O negative blood. The Basque people have a lot of O negative, have O negative blood, high, high rates. It's way up there. It's like 70% of them. What an amazing show tonight. Perfect conversation, Leslie. Um, oh. how, how, how booked up are you? I'm not as booked up as I'd like to be. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair. That's a good I'm answer. Not. I'm not. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I, I see clients on a full-time basis. Um, I'm in the process of writing another book. My, my first book, if you're interested, is called um, Intersections, A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact. And it's on Amazon, Amazon.com, Amazon.ca. And it's about, I had a chance to work with one amazing client for many, many sessions. And we sort of wrote this book together about his um, uh, recalled memories. And there's a lot of literal um, a lot of transcripts from actual sessions. So I think anyone who's interested in the process even would, would really enjoy that book. Um, I'm putting on a little, um, a little one day event here in, uh, in uh, Toronto, but it's, uh, it, we've got some wonderful guests um, and uh, including Daniel Sheehan and uh, it's called the um, the Contact and Disclosure Symposium. And there's nothing going, there are no, uh, uh, what shall I call, expos, nothing going on in Canada right now. That, that There were many things, they're all gone. So I'm the only one, and my crew, we're the only people doing anything here, I think. Uh, so we're, uh, we're going to have this wonderful little event, and hopefully that will turn into a bigger event next year. And then you can come, Jimmy, and you can introduce some guests and do your thing and man i want to hang out with you yeah That's all right. I'll, I'll just come for that okay danny she, danny she and i see him all the time yeah <laughs> but, but, but i'll come hang out with you now all uh, right if somebody wants to get a hold of you the easiest uh, way is it is it lightworkhypnosis.com they can yes. find you there Absolutely. There's a, there's a little, you know, there's a page where they can put their question and their information and that email will go right to me. Now I always, it may take me a minute, but I always answer anyone who, you know, reaches out and, and, you know, you might have had an experience. You're not sure that it's worth pursuing. You want to talk about it, but you want to remain anonymous. I don't care. I will be happy to talk to anyone out there. This is my, this is my life path. This is my journey to assist these dear, special, wonderful people who have been chosen for these contact experiences. Uh, you know, I, I refuse to put a negative spin on any of this. I'm not a David Icke fan. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't, <laughs> I can't live with that guy, those kinds of ideas. I think they're, they're, that's not my reality. And that's not the reality that I seem to be working in. I seem to be working in a reality of benevolence and um, uh, uh, much more Bashar-like than anything else, I would have to say. So, yes, please go to my website, lightworkhypnosis.com, and shoot me a little note, and I'll be more than happy uh, to to uh, to engage with you, and if you if you care to look at my little uh, my little show, it's called Contact TV, and it's available on YouTube. Thank you so much, Leslie. I look forward to our next conversation, and anytime you need me up there in Toronto, oh I'm just a yes, call away. Okay, I can't wait. We are we will have so much fun. You won't be you 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 won't even believe how much fun you'll have. I love Toronto. <laughs> I love Toronto. I love everything about Toronto. We got to be more. Yeah. <laughs> Behave and be well. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 everybody talks to me about LA has got all the events. Everything's always, you know, so yeah, I agree. We need more events. West Coast, East Coast, Vancouver, Toronto, yeah. Miami, Chicago, New York. Yeah. 
Detroit. You know, we we need everywhere. we need an event e- e- everywhere. Absolutely. Everywhere. Well, I think that I think that's what we're going to see now since we're coming out of COVID and uh you know, we realize we're not ever going to get grant money for doing any of this. We have to figure out how to do it ourselves. New York style. <sighs> New York keep style. Rolling, keep yeah. rolling that rock uphill. That's it. <laughs> Leslie, enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, I will, man. You take care. It's been such a pleasure. All right, Jimmy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye now. Leslie Mitchell Clark. Her links are below, and uh, we've also got them up on social media and, of course, over on our website. And uh, what am I doing uh, tomorrow night? Uh, tomorrow night, oh, Britt Elders is with us. So that is tomorrow night. And uh, that, this is the deal. Britt has been researching shooting documentaries and the subject for more than 50 years and having her on the show tomorrow night is a really big deal. You're not going to want to miss that. So I'll see you tomorrow night. Fade to black is produced by Hilton J Palm, Renee Newman and Michelle freed. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dex. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Kevin. Webmaster is drew the geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Spaceboymusic.com. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network, and this broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2024 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network, Inc. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Until tomorrow night with Britt Elders, I want you to be safe. Go back, Lee Tappy.